something I need yeah. to. I, I did. No. So you should be able to hear yourself I can loud hear and clear. Loudly. Can you hear yourself? Yeah. You, you yeah. probably have like super powerful hearing. Yeah. Well, if I come up there here, it's like, there you go. Now, feels now like I hear this you. thing's going okay. in my mouth, you know? Well, but that's kind of the way that it is supposed okay. to sound a little, so a little harder, yeah. Right yeah. here I'm supposed to be. There you, you go. Can hear. There okay. You can hear. Okay, that's good. So we're already recording? I've been recording since okay. early this morning. Oh, about my big head? You were recording yeah. that? All of that is in there. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we... we, we uh... <laughs> All right. Okay. We're ready to start. So uh, th this is me taking over for an interview, and we'll, we'll see right. how we go. I'll try and get through Are all the questions. Are we having coffee? coffee? We're having... Oh, you didn't oh, you get didn't the coffee? I didn't coffee. get any coffee. My apologies. Coffee? So I'm going to... I'm telling you that... that I will let you know the question that's coming up okay. Okay. next, but then <laughs> I'll go back to the original. So the next question that's going to come up, number two, is of course, uh, what happens when you're in an institute where you have students that are really performing amazingly well, and so the other students have these role models, and contrast that to a place where you are describing to your students success, they want to believe you, but they don't know what really what you're talking about because those role models are not there. But let's go first back to the first question, which is just imagine you are an undergraduate student and maybe you're in my lab or in, in one of your labs. Um, presumably it's obvious that the PI is not gonna come and beg you to go to graduate school or ask you. It's, it's for you to sort of uh, man up, so to speak. Uh, and you have other consideration. Maybe your parents are telling you to go and work with your uncle. So you're that undergraduate student. You've done a year or two in one of our labs. What, in your view, should you be thinking at that stage? Let's go with Anita first. If I was an, if I'm an undergraduate yeah. student, what am I thinking? Right? Um, I think. Well, when I was an undergraduate student, I was thinking science. Right? I was thinking I want to go into science. I want to do research. I enjoy being mm -hmm. in it. But I had the opportunity to be part of the Mark program. So if we're talking about someone who hasn't been able to do that, I mean, maybe they're just thinking, what type of job can I get? with a biology degree. And where would that be at? What does it look like? But I don't think many of my students come to me and say, hey, I want to get a PhD. It usually is something that I say, you know, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? That's kind of where I'm at whenever I see students that want to do that. So should they learn to have more initiative? I think they ought to know what they want to do before they come and do an undergraduate internship. There's certain expectations, right? So doing research is expensive, doing it's time and labor intensive, uh, it takes a long time to learn it, it, takes a certain type of character. So probably maybe most PIs are expecting they already know what they want to do. What do you think? Well, I, I think that you need to keep in mind in what particular institution the students are actually doing their undergrad. Because there are institutions where you have a good number of PhD students, mm -hmm. and you have a good number of labs that will actually accommodate undergrad students, and they will allow them to do research side to side with those grad students that they have. And there are plenty of universities where that's not really mm -hmm. possible at all. And I am a good example of that kind of institution. I actually did my undergraduate degree in Colombia, in Universidad de los Andes in Colombia. And it's the top private university in Colombia, but still the number of labs that were doing research and that would actually allow undergraduate students to do research was extremely small. So I didn't get a chance to do basically any research as an undergraduate student. And the idea of doing a PhD, it was already in my head but I have no clue how it got there, to be honest. Like, I so, don't know wait, when it was the first time. what would you have done? What would you have done, right? You, were you getting a biology degree? I was getting a microbiology okay, degree. Okay, so that you were getting my, a my microbiology degree. Yes. When mm -hmm. you chose bachelor's. the microbiology bachelor's, wh why did you choose oh, that? I, I already knew that. Okay, so I, as a little kid, I had two goals. Either I was going to become a professional soccer player, goal number one, okay. very standard for Colombia, <laughs> it's a soccer culture down there. And goal number two, I was going to become a famous scientist. Okay, so you knew Those, early on, yeah. before you even got into research, that you wanted to do that. How about you, dude? What did you... Uh, no, I just instinctively knew I had to get in there and get my hands dirty, and I had to uh, learn to bug my professors, and I would go up to them and ask them questions, and, and 
and I think maybe the question was maybe they should have more initiative and I don't know if it's surreal that they need to come and tell you this is what I would like to do what do you think are my options are they realistic like uh, but they seem to either chat to their friends and colleagues or I, I, I don't know but I don't think they, I get a feeling that there's much direction I maybe think they're afraid of us well, well, that's yeah. one thing, but the other, I, thing, I, I, the, the, yeah. the other thing is they are also very close to social media. Right. Yeah. And the one thing that predominates in social media these days is money, basically. Yeah. So, so what they see well, is, there's is money a model and then there's of making uh, mo money. A fear of being in academia. There's a yeah. lot on social media about how poor it is to be in academia or and how that, negative it is. And there is that sense that I think it's becoming quite predominant that people now are trying to have more of a life than a career. Okay. It's one of those things that are like continuously exposed in social media to our younger generations. You know, it's like in the past, people used to actually dream on having a career and making it big in whatever area it was that they were interested in, in pursuing. But nowadays, people want to have time and they want to travel and they want to have experiences and they want to do everything that people of previous generations will actually do after retirement. Okay. Mm -hmm. All so right. it's like they are inverting, I don't know, those stages in life, I think. Okay, so next, uh, after the second question, we'll go on to students that hit the downturn. But before that, when I was doing a PhD, you know, you could go to the bar, you could go to the elevator, and out would come James Briscoe or Pablo Rodriguez Viciana. You knew they had just had a nature paper, and you knew that their science would change the world significantly. Um, so you knew it was possible. I had rows with future Nobel Prize winners because I disagreed with them and that made them human and that made their high standards reachable. If you are not an institution where those role models are there and you're telling your student work harder and you might reach this height, they might not believe you because you're describing a fairy tale because they have never seen these people that you're talking about that reach those heights. They've seen them on TV, but they're not real. So what do you do if, you, if, you, if you're not an institution where you have those unique, extraordinary individuals? Well, I think that if you are motivated, you will find the source of inspiration wherever it is that they are at. Um, and one of the beautiful things of, of nowadays, and, and I go back to social media, is that if you really care about learning about the people who are doing the top level of research around the world, they make videos and they post those videos out there. Um, uh, Philip Sharp, Dr. Philip Sharp, the, the one who described splicing, he actually has a couple of videos out there about how he discovered the process of splicing, how he came with the initial idea, the experiments that were done, and he presents them in a way that are super simplified and really easy to understand, even for somebody who is just getting started in a, in a bachelor's in biology. So all of that is there. If you are motivated, you can actually find it there. And I think that if you are in the kind of institution where that kind of levels are not present, you know, you, you have to then go out and try to look for that in, in other places. But, but let's face it, there's only gonna, like, we are not all gonna reach the pinnacle of a cell nature science paper. So what is it that we can do in, in, if we were the individuals that are in those institutions, how can we get those students to look at us as the role models? Where maybe we have a little bit more time, maybe we teach, what, how can we get those individuals to look at us as being successful? Okay. Okay, so um, number four that's gonna come up in a minute is on you trying to get your students to a certain standards and there being something in the way, but before that, you know, research goes like this and, and sometimes you go down Julia, and you Julia, stay Julia, down. Can I, can I? Sure. I guess the lack of sleep is actually making me yep. dare this man from Italy to challenge him and say like, but we are leaving a lot of stuff in there that is not really being explored because Anita just brought up a really good point. Yeah, yeah, so the point of do? this is we're going to go back afterwards and say we need to have a 20 minute just on that okay. point. We're going to expand because okay. I want to, okay. okay. yeah, this is okay. a buffet. Okay. And so then, you want to go quickly through the Yeah, yeah, to some then, of them and right, see okay. how, okay. yeah, okay. yeah. Sounds because good. I didn't know yes. what would take. Okay, so you, yeah, you have ups yeah, and downs and then you see a student, you, you can tell it by the look on their eyes, they're starting to go downhill. They, they're going to hit a point that maybe they're only going to do a Western every two weeks, if that. And what do you do? Do you stay away because they need to learn to swim on their own? Do you intervene and say, hey, you, mm -hmm. 
your performance has collapsed by 98%, what's going on, what do you do when uh, one of your students hits a slump? I, I first wait a while. So I wait a few days, see how the slump is, is working out. Maybe that's a couple of weeks, I don't know, but I, I sort of watch it. But if it goes too long, I, I, I intervene, I have a meeting. I kind of tell them in the meeting, let's go back, take a step back, let's do something easy so that you feel like you've had a success. You know, yeah. lots of times they can go through and do a genotyping reaction and they can get that to work. Then they start to feel like, oh yeah, I'm back on track, right? And then go back and get to the hard stuff. And usually they will have rejuvenated themselves a little bit, right? Yeah, I also take a step back and I wait for a little while, but then after a while I, I do take a more active role and I approach them and I try to just basically see what's going on with them. Because it's, it's not always something that is work-related. Yeah. There are plenty of times that our students in particular, they, they have a lot of other things going around because a lot of our students have families in the local area and that can affect their productivity quite a bit. So, yeah. so I try to, to inquire if there is something outside the lab or if the issue is actually something in the lab. If it is something in the lab, like Anita said, that they have lost confidence in themselves, I try to kind of something similar. Just give them something that seems less challenging, more approachable, more doable, so they can re regain some of that confidence and, and then move from there. But if, if it is just a lack of interest that is actually hitting them, then the issue needs to be addressed from another perspective. And sometimes, I'll tell you, I don't know how to address that. But how do you draw the line between understanding what be, might be happening privately with mm -hmm. where you're at? Because getting too close is a problem. Yeah. I, I yeah, think that's, getting that's, too close is a problem. They will start to perceive you as being somebody different than you are. And then when you do have to intervene or, or be the you know person that pushes them, I, w I don't want to say bad guy, but you know, when you have to do that, then you, you run into a huge problem. So I understand that you want to be sort of like, you know, a seer and understanding, but I think there needs to be a line of, of just about what you ask and how you get involved. Yeah, yeah I think that, that just knowing the cause is a first step. Mm -hmm. um, but then what you do once you have determined that, that's really, I mean, there is a whole lot of different shades of gray that go into that because if it is something personal, yeah, okay, but while you can understand what is happening, you cannot simply allow personal matters to completely overtake their responsibilities in the lab. So you have to draw a line where, where there is a minimum that they have to be able to perform at. Mm -hmm. And if you are in any other profession, if you don't perform at a minimum, you will be basically kicked out. Mm -hmm. So, it, I mean, there is, there is yeah, there's, there's the a guy, who, there. he, he breaks up with his girlfriend and his lab productivity collapses yeah. for yeah. X months. Yeah. Okay, so n coming up next will be um, Diana Natalicio's comment on uh, universities such as UTEP and confidence. But before that, uh, I want to take up this idea that you see students leave your institution, maybe it's not the best institution, but you're able to place them at some of the world's leading institutions, Harvard, let's say. And you see that maybe your colleagues have sent students to Harvard and almost without fail, uh, within three months they're fired or they quit. And you, you say, well, damn it, I, if, and I'm going to do all I can not to let that happen to my student. And so you start pushing them not in a realistic way because you're not pushing them for your institution. You're pushing them to be ready for that institution. And they are going to have a shock when they get there. So you're pushing them and the other students are going, what, what? What is the professor doing to that poor person? And then you get chubby on the third showing up and chatting to that student and say, you know, if you were to come to my lab, I wouldn't push you that hard. I don't think it's fair that you should be pushed that hard. You have a right to take it easy and you should enjoy other aspects of life. So maybe you should change labs. Um, a hypothetical, uh, but maybe not. It, it might in some points have come closer to home for some of you. Uh, do you just say, well, there are big boys and big girls now. If they want to come to train with me, I'll do it. But if they're going to start to believe the fairy tale, maybe they're not such big boys or big girls. Or what do you do? Because this, this, can, this can cripple years of work to building someone to yeah. their potential. Yeah. I, you want to take that one first? Go, go ahead. Oh, go, ahead. Okay. go ahead. Um, well, I mean, I think 
it definitely hits home because I have the reputation that, you know, I'm a little bit tough on my students, but tough being that I just set an expectation that maybe not other, every other lab sets. So I did go through a period of time when, you know, my students are maybe looking around saying like, well, this is crazy. Why are we doing this? Uh, so I thought maybe I need to change, right? But changing didn't make me happy, didn't do anything for my program, and it didn't really train the students that I really cared about to be better at their job, right? Or to do mm -hmm. their job when they leave here. So I ultimately converted back, but I think that I have to, I had to tell my students, look, I'm not looking around comparing myself and my productivity to anyone else. Not anyone down the hall, not anyone that doesn't show up, not anyone that comes and stays longer than me. I am doing this to build myself. So my approach now has been, that's the story and that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna let them know, this is the way I'm gonna train you up front. If you're not satisfied with that, then maybe there's another option for you. And I'm willing to let those people go have what's a best fit for them. And as long as I'm transparent, the people that work for me know that this is my approach and this is what I'm gonna do. I don't know if that leads me to have zero students in five years, mm -hmm. we'll see. I guess it's yeah, an experiment. Yeah, yeah. Right. And Herman? Well, it's, I think I've gone through different periods. Um, I had times when I thought that if people didn't elevate to a certain standard, they, they would not graduate under my uh, mentorship. I would not allow them to, to graduate. But then, you know, I guess life proved me wrong that, that you cannot keep the same standards for everybody. And I became a lot more flexible. Um, but, but the one thing that, I, that I've become fully convinced now is that there are people who compete with themselves, like Anita was, was indicating. The people who set the standard based on where they want to get to, like the goals that they are pursuing, those are the people who basically are gonna get there no matter what. Mm -hmm. Like whether they are with you or with somebody else, it doesn't matter who is the mentor for those people, they are driven, they have clear expectations, they know where, where they are headed to, and they are going to do whatever it takes to get there. And then there are the people who are just basically trying to see what fits them, and, and they don't really have a clear plan, and it's basically like a ship in the middle of the ocean just going to whatever the wind takes them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are going to not really make it any precise place. They are just going to go wherever the waters take, take them. And for those people who are not self-motivated, it doesn't matter how hard you try or okay. what kind of standards you, you set for them. All you can do is help them to have at least clear that there is a minimum that they have to be able to perform at. But more than that, I think it is really impossible for you or for anybody else. I mean, if you don't I have it. I think the earlier you let go, the better. Right. I, I also think that the, the, the chubby on the third kind of person is, is categorically setting them up for failure, but I letting, agree. letting them be happy in being set up for failure and, and almost condoning that you should just do that and you should be happy with a tenth of what you're capable of. But there's no reason to pay tuition if you, and pay for, yeah. the, for a PhD and put in all those yeah. Yeah, no, tears I, I and effort. That. There's right. no reason to do that if, you know, so I personally think that, that those individuals that are on the third floor or wherever floor, you know, the one that you're referring to, <laughs> I think those individuals, they're probably, they're, they're doing what's best for what they think, but they're missing the point that, that the type of student that may not want to come into the lab maybe just isn't isn't excited about doing a PhD. Right. I, I mean, I think I told my boss, I'm just going to veto those people from any student interaction because it's hard enough to try and help someone get to their potential and to do it with a, a mother-in-law there constantly nagging, it, um, it just doesn't help. Yeah. And I don't know what else you can do. This confronting them is in... in they won't listen yeah, to reason. Yeah, yeah. They obviously have nothing to do with their lives because if they're coming to interfere with your program. So all you can do, I guess, is quarantine and, 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 and protect the student. But, but they are adults. But, but students even, are that, adults. even that is difficult to do sure, because, because sure. those students that belong to those environments are going to interact sure, with sure, your sure. students yeah. and that's going to contaminate them. That's because, what happened. Because okay. basically they, it creates a different culture, a culture of why are you working so hard? Look, right. we, are, we are making the yeah. same amount of money. We are being paid exactly yeah. the same because we are all graduate students. And we're and TAing. Yeah, we're, we're doing TAing. Whatever, we yeah. are doing exactly the same thing, but we're having a good time and you guys yeah. are not. 
sure. We party very frequently. We go out. We, we yeah. So it, it creates something that ends up pushing the overall standard down. Down, down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we'll, we'll come next to uh, allowing young people to challenge you, um, if that's the right way to go. But let's go first to uh, Diana Natalicio had this video years ago, I think it was maybe 12 years ago, where she made the claim that UTEP had everything it needed to succeed. And she felt that the main ingredient they had lacked for a long time was the confidence. And I, I think she may have hinted that the confidence had arrived. I can't remember that, that final part of it. So I guess the question to you is, if you're in a place such as UTEP, do you think that we now have the confidence to go forward? Uh, are we past having that question? Or do we still need to seal the deal in some respect? Do, do we have the confidence that we are, for example, a UT system uh, worthy university? It's, it's a difficult question to mm -hmm. answer because I don't, I don't know if the issue was confidence at any given time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was really the issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was probably one of them, mm -hmm. but the main issue, I don't know if I will, I will define it like that. Right. Because part of the things is we create also a certain set of expectations out of people in different places. And the amount that, that is invested in those different places reflects the expectations that you have for those, those places. Mm -hmm. When you look at how much money is invested throughout the state of Texas in different institutions, there, there is a difference, mm -hmm. which reflects also at the level of even the local high schools, mm -hmm. how much investment they actually get from, from different uh, localities. So I don't know. It's, it's a complicated question. Yeah. It's a really complicated question. So I don't know if... I don't know if the confidence that Dr. Natalicio referred to back then was something that she saw as the main issue because of another reason, mm -hmm. um, but there is definitely a lack of confidence that goes with overall Hispanic culture in America, and that's actually a different thing that, that I think needs to be mentioned. Okay. Um, we were talking with Anita the other day that there are, there are some cultures that when they immigrated into America, the people who first arrived to America, they had certain jobs, but then their kids go on to have a substantially higher level of education and attainment altogether, whereas um, others don't follow that trend. So, so I don't know if that's also associated with that idea of confidence. It's, it's a complex sure. issue. I mean, I, I do definitely see from being at other universities the, and, and other institutions, just in my training, that there is a lower level of confidence from the students that we train and mentor. Um, is it all confidence or is it a cultural type of, you know, intimidation? They're intimidated by, you know, us being a professor, you know, going back to your question number one, you know, I think some of that has to do with being intimidated with the, the status or the stature that someone might carry. So I do think there's an element of confidence, but I would agree that it's not entirely confidence because I think, you know, as you move from students all the way up to maybe faculty or staff or, you know, especially faculty, most of us did not come from Utah, right? Mm -hmm. So we're coming from other places. So we maybe yeah. don't lack confidence. Um, not all of us anyway. So I would mm -hmm. say it's yeah. not the only issue, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it is something that we do have. So I, I, it's known that I, um, I wrote an email to one of your students, uh, copying you and others, saying, very good, I just am waiting for that student to develop bigger balls. And then I said, soon, please. And, and one of you wrote back to me and said, you copied the student. And I went, yes, it's, it's my wish that they will find the nerve to, to make that extra step. So maybe... Uh, maybe more diplomacy, but maybe that was a sort of an expectation that, yeah, they, they find the courage to come and speak to us. They, they, they maybe get a little bit more confidence. But as, as Herman hinted, maybe there is also a systemic investment and, and the, the achievement reflects the level of investment. Okay, um, so we're going to come to Prince in a second. But before that, one of the things that scared me and leads to this question is Bert Vogelstein once was in an audience and he said, you know where the new ideas will come from? they will come from the young people because we established investigators. We know what won't work, and so we won't do the experiments. The young people don't know enough of anything to know what won't work, 
So they will do the silly experiment or the crazy experiment. And one of those crazy experiments is the actual new door to a, a new avenue. So, well, that means you have to allow some freedom for your students to go off at a tangent and for them to say you're wrong. That theory you've been pushing is flawed. So it's a very difficult thing to do, though, because you're also supposed to be training them. So have you ever considered that? And have you ever allowed some space for the students to challenge you or take you in a different direction or, or not, as the case may be? Let me, let me jump into that. Mm -hmm. I actually encourage my students to challenge me mm -hmm. and to let me know that I might be wrong. And I'm, I'm happy to say it out loud. Mm -hmm. Hey, I might be wrong here because I want to establish from the beginning the fact that while I'm the mentor and I'm the person with the most experience in my own lab, I'm not perfect, and I don't have all the answers, and I we don't never, have all the solutions. We never thought you were, but I mean, we like well, you Well, I mean, it, sometimes it's more evident. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I agree with you. We, that was, I mean, that I was mean, a cheap I, mean, I apologize. That no, 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 I mean, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't have a problem with that. I'm the all first right, so one you, to say that, that I'm prone to make mistakes, right. and I'm happy to say it. Uh, I, I think you're coming at this, I, I'm sorry, but this is gonna be a little racy topic, right. but you're coming this, at this from a, a man's perspective. Nice. So, oh, 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 oh. Ouch. I think that's one, <laughs> one zero, one zero. To Wait a second. You, why, why, why are you saying that? Because, because I, of I, my I, experience. I, so I didn't think that there I was any sexism on this. Be, no, what I'm saying is that you, as a man, <laughs> command respect from your students. And it's just a general are, thing. Are you me. trying to indicate that that's because most of my students are female? No, no, no. All right, okay. I don't care what the gender of the female or, or the, the, the students are. What okay. I'm saying is the gender of the PI. Just clarifying the, the point. The gender of the PI will impact what what you just said. So when you said you let them challenge right. you, challenge is different than do you accept their ideas? Right. Do you uh, motivate them to have their own ideas? Do you say, yeah, let's definitely go down that road? Mm -hmm. Do you ask them for feedback on grants? Do you ask them for feedback on papers? Do you go? So I do all of those things, ask for feedback. But as far as challenge, I don't really do that. And it's because in my experience, either because of my youth, you know. <laughs> <laughs> She's quite young. Yeah. Yeah. We, no, we no, have to I say, just we, hit we, 40. We have to, you didn't have to say that out loud there. I, I mean, just hit 40, and but so now... It's you, a negative you had, to be young, right? Yes, 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 that's what I'm saying. I am now but, qualified but at the to the not same time, say young. All right, okay. 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 So, so, I, so I guess 40. in certain circles, it's bad to be 40. But it's in others, but in others, it's bad to be less than 40. So if you're a PI and you start at the age 33 through experience and you recruit a 33-year-old grad student, you yeah. do not want that student to challenge you. Right. Because you will lose... All kinds of respect okay, from so, everybody. So, so here is my perspective on this, though. If, it, if the challenge is coming from a point of science, data, facts, and ideas, it's a different thing. But if the challenge is coming from the way that you interact with people or from the, on the way that you set the expectations for your lab or what you consider are the important things that need to be addressed in lab meeting or stuff like that, that is more practical than but really data-driven. A, a challenge in lab meeting, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you, so if you have a lab meeting and you are doing the lab meeting, you have your students in there, and one student is clearly saying, you know, I want to do it X. I'm not going to change. I'm never going to make a difference. But the, you're, you're the PI and you're saying, hey, no, you, you absolutely cannot do that because I've done it 50 times and, it, and that simply doesn't work, going back to your mm -hmm. point. It can be a very simple assay, right? But if you have someone to constantly challenge you, particularly in front of undergraduate right. students, you will run into the problem that you will lose I don't want to say control because well, you don't, you're not trying to control everything, mm -hmm. but you will lose um, the ability to, to, to mentor all the students. Okay, so okay. tough, tough okay. balancing. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. Uh, we're going to go. And, and I, I appreciate the fact that you broke the, the gender the issue. Gender issue. I, know, I know that it is a gender and you're totally right on, on target. I mean, when, it could have been you. Say, you. No, when you say that, that we are privileged. No, she said no, you. No. She said you. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> That's right. She said, she said, male, male. <laughs> I don't know, male. Julio. I don't know, Julio. What are you saying there? Okay. I'm just right. saying that there is a slight. So yeah. there is no, a, there is a slight way to perceive this. And it depends on, 
It, it just many depends factors. on many yes. factors. Yes. I Absolutely. struggled with youth and I struggled with being female. Mm. Right. I cannot tell you which one of those was more of a struggle for me because they were simultaneous. Right. Well, I was actually challenged by students one time that I was teaching a parastology class to a classroom full of medical students. And I was challenged by them because they, they said, you cannot teach us. And when I said, why is that? I have a PhD, I have done research, among others, in parasitology. So I'm well trained to be able to teach this class. And the issue that was raised to my face was that I was Hispanic. And therefore, I was not entitled to be teaching that. So class. as you can see, it can come from many yeah. factors, right? I am just trying to say the, the, uh, the idea of encouraging critique. Critique, I definitely encourage. I, I think you could talk to any of my students and they would say, you know, like she, she encourages us to, to critique science appropriately and even to have their own ideas. But there are just things like if I put my foot down, I don't budge from it. Because even in, maybe if I get to a point where I'm wrong, I cannot because then I will lose the audience. All right. Uh, yeah. So uh, we're going to move on to Prince, but and then we're going to move on to the other one, which is what makes a great chair. So we're <laughs> going to move out to what makes a great chair. Uh, but what I will say about the question that's coming up uh, is about sort of uh, be, having the ability to, to give your vision. But first of all, uh, Prince once sang that maybe I'm just like my father, he's never satisfied. So are you, are you too demanding? Are you too demanding with your, are you ever satisfied with your students? Anita. Rumor based or truth and reality? <laughs> um, you know, rumor is I'm well, too demanding, right? Okay, um, wait a second. Your students are not here. It has to be your honest opinion okay. of yourself, um, I think, right? Character right, flaw, I'm going to admit it, you know. Uh, character flaw, uh, I'm not easily satisfied. I don't know why. Maybe I can change. I work mm -hmm. on it every day. Um, I'm sort of a perfectionist. <laughs> yeah, I go because it's getting worse. My highest standards are the ones that I apply to me. Mm -hmm. And I very frequently am kind of dissatisfied with my performance. So when I don't feel that I'm living up to my own expectations, I feel a little unqualified to be too rough on others. So I tend to be a little happier about the performance of others around me than about my own performance. Um, so I don't know. that that. I would I agree with that. I, I would definitely agree with that. I am usually happy with students that keep, keep to their end of the bargain, no matter whether something works or doesn't work. I mean, it really doesn't, that doesn't affect me. But for me, I, I have the same, I'm not usually satisfied. I, I imagine I'm not out of fear that, that we haven't done enough and we're about to collapse. And so you're always, you're always worried that it's not enough. Um, but. I'm asking the question. So let's, uh, with the last two, the, the last question is going to come up in a minute is on, on, on sort of positive aspects. But before we go to that, I mean, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I guess I'm disappointed is uh, there are different people that have visions of the future, but there is sometimes a restriction on, on people being able to voice that, which I find disappointing because someone can voice their view of a future and people just don't vote for it. They just don't buy the product. So I'm trying to correct the, what I think is a wrong here, and I would like you to imagine that in a country X, you institute Y, you are given the power to kind of Lego build either the, the manager, the director, the dean, or let's say the chair of a department, but the person who will intimately manage 5, 10, 15, 20 PIs. So they, let's say, ahead of a department. But you are able to instill some key ingredients. So I don't know who wants to go first, and I, it's, I guess it's an open question. Can you imagine what would be your fundamental ingredients for uh, building a presumably successful department head? And this is a, could be a, someone who doesn't exist because they're a collection of five or six different mm -hmm. features. But okay, I, I think that the key element is to have somebody whose main goal is to allow the maximum development of the potential of everybody that he's directing, including graduate students, undergraduate students, as well as faculty, as well as administrative personnel. 
it has to be somebody whose goal is that to allow for the best performance of everybody in the team because that's what that department is it is a team and it needs to play as a team it cannot be something that is made of completely you know individuals that do not interact at all and that each one of them is completely on their own game no it needs to be something where where the qualities the capacities of each individual adds to the capacities of the others so that in the end, the group as a whole is capable of achieving a lot more than the individuals are on their own. So if you have somebody who is driven to create that kind of sense of unity and empowerment, rather than having somebody who is providing for extra barriers as if there weren't enough already, mm. um, you know, I think that that's, that's the main ingredient that I think is what I would wish to have in a future chair for the department. Okay, Anita, um, ingredients. I think, it's, I think it's someone who builds a culture of expectations. Mm. And I don't think that expectations have, so, so I read somewhere um, that, that the most successful companies are not the ones that have the best and most money mm. and investment and, and you know, uh, strategic plan and things of that nature. It's actually the most successful companies are those that have you know CEOs or CFOs that build a culture where people rely on each other and people believe in each other in the, and have support, right? And so I think that person has to build and set themselves, set the tone, right? Set the tone for what are the expectations that are required of every member of the team so that they can support one another. So they build upon everybody's individual strengths, right? Instead of mm -hmm. just throwing people together or, or people finding their own groups, right? I think they have to be someone who organizes based on people's strengths. And they build this culture of, no, you know, I'm doing this because I want to do this. I'm not doing this because he or she tells me to do this. I'm invested in this personally. So everybody's then more willing to go the extra mile because they're invested in it just as much, right? They care mm. about it. And it's, it, it has to be a culture that's built as opposed to a dictatorship, I guess. Yeah. So yeah. I never yeah. really had follow-up questions, but I'm wondering if this creates a follow-up question, which is, you know, by, by natural selection, uh, professors have to learn to mentor, have to learn to publish, have to learn to write grants, but there is no training for any professor to become a good coordinator or department head of other professors because that involves them aiding someone in a field they, they have nothing. And it's a different talent, presumably, for which they've had no training until they may, they may get thrown in. Um, and so it's almost a, a job where most of the time it's without training and you, 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 they find out whether they're good at it. Well, but isn't that true for pretty much every other thing that we do well, other than research? Mm -hmm. The only Probably. thing that we are actually trained for when you do a PhD is to research. Mm -hmm. How to teach? Very, right. very rarely people are trained on how to teach, how to mentor, only if you are lucky enough to have people that you are allowed to sure. mentor while you are doing a postdoc or as a PhD student. I mean, basically, we, we have a system that trains us in only one thing, but then when, when you finally get into an academic job, now the job has all of these other things that you need to do that you've been trained for one, but not for any of the others. So there is like a natural selection that happens at that point. It's like if you had all the other innate features that would allow you to then all of a sudden develop proper qualities to achieve the goals so, but for wait, those what, other what things. What you're saying, though, is like if we select the department chair because they're good at research, then that what you're saying here is that that doesn't necessarily mean they'll be good at being your leader because they have no, no training in that, right? What I'm saying is is there is no specific training for that. In a way, you, you over time, develop it as you go, but we are never really given a specific training on that. Uh, and there are people who are natural leaders. That's and what I was going to say. I was yeah. going to ask you then, they is, it, is this training, just something that people inherently have within them to naturally create the culture 
where people will trust and buy in because you have to have buy in, right? You have to have buy in from the faculty. You can't be a department chair if nobody wants you to be the department chair. Nobody yeah, will yeah. follow you, right? Yeah, nobody yeah, will yeah. buy into your program. Among others, you have to be a great communicator and you need to be to a very high degree, a very likable person, mm -hmm. I think. Right, so I, th I think I, I won't interject too much other than, um, well, some may have it and some may develop it, but for example, the British, there's no training for prime minister. The British got a prime minister not too while ago, and after 45 days, they decided, rightly or wrongly, no, and they had a mechanism. And I'm not sure in many cases in academia those mechanisms exist. So the trial and error yeah. is, 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 yeah. is, is, is from almost yeah. a fixed term. You're mm -hmm. stuck. And that person is also stuck. And what are they going to do, right? So, but uh, that may be a topic. So I've had my edited out bit. Sorry, but that was intentional. So that take one. We've got through most of the questions. We'll see how long it took us. So I think I've done all my job. I want to finish on two things. One is our uh, sampler question from the student audience. And the last one that I have written down is what is the happiest that you were made by something your students did in your lab with you or for your program? This is a family program, so bear that in mind. But do you remember going back, uh, something your students did as part of their training that you thought, okay, that, that's made me a little bit happier than I am normally? Me first. Go first. I mean, I think I've had many of those moments. So I really do love being a mentor. I really do te like to teach in the class. And I've seen multiple students at different stages of their career uh, do quite well. So mm -hmm. I've had many students get summer internships. I've, I'm really, really happy when I see them get something like that. Get into graduate school, get into MD, PhD, get a postdoc, graduate. I think I had a really happy moment when my first PhD student graduated, so that was a really big deal for me and for the student. So I think in general, um, I don't probably show it on a daily basis on like an experiment or anything like that, but those are the moments that I really cherish as being a faculty. Yeah. I would say something similar. There have been so many. There have been so many moments when I have felt really absolutely delighted by the people that I've been lucky enough to train throughout my life. Um, and I think that that's something that students should really be fully aware of, that while doing science is something that we love, having the ability to say that you have contributed in somebody else's life, that you've allowed other people opportunities that probably without you they probably wouldn't have had, you know, that's just one of those things that really fills you up with pride and true happiness. Yeah. I think that's the best moment that yeah. we have, is yeah. seeing them be successful. Yeah. We, it's, we it's invest a, a tremendous amount of ourselves to try to get them to a point where they can be happy. Mm -hmm. And so when you see them be happy, regardless of what career they choose, I mean, I think it's a misnomer when people say, oh, you know, academics, they only want you to be in academia. But I mean, for me, that's not true because yeah. I just want to see my students be happy in whatever their chosen uh, field career is, yes. field, mm -hmm. whatever yeah. it is. And so anything that I can do along the way to get them there, that makes me happy. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so yeah. I'll like, pass this around now. And uh, uh, meanwhile, I'll make my, so we all pick one piece of paper and have it go around. And while you guys are each picking, and then you'll read it for a second, Wait, think so, about so, it. And so then we're you'll... supposed to get only the well, paper I had three, and, no, we... and no coffee, no chocolate, no... You can grab a chocolate. So I'll just say for my part, as we, we all unroll the one we got, and then we'll try and tackle it as a, as a group no of three. Chocolate. Oh my uh, gosh, I don't know if I'll be able to uh, I even think look at the question. For me, it's, uh, like, it's the fact that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have a complaint at the end. So it's the fact that... Um, my first two PhD students were able to go and learn intracranial injection and, and use it to generate data for me. And I have no idea how they do that. And my current PhD student, Diana Prospero, with the help of a group, went off and learned to do intraportal injection. And I have no idea how to do that. I mean, probably I shouldn't single out those two cases, but there were two examples where my students were able to go away from me and I had the confidence that I had given them the tools to do something that I just can't reach that far. And I still don't know what exactly they're doing, but we arrived at that point. And so that was mine. So uh, we, we, we have our edited bit. We have our uh, topical references. 
who wants to go first with their surprise question? And we'll try All and answer right. it. This was too surprising. I don't know. Go for it. <laughs> okay, the question is, what are the principal skills that you expect or look up from a student? Hmm. Principal skills. Um, you know, I, I don't think I look for skills. Hmm. I look for attitude. And the attitude that I really look for is real motivation. Like people who really like being in the lab, that really feel like there is nothing more exciting than getting something that is a clear answer to a question that we have formulated. The thrill of being the first person to know the answer to a scientific question is just, I mean, there is no comparison to that. It's like being the first person to conquer Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. Like, you are the first one there. Nobody before you knew the answer to that question. And if you are thrilled by, by that kind of experience, you know, you, I want you with me. I want you in my team. I want you to be there. Because that's, that's the kind of student that is a pleasure to be with and to mentor. Because you know that there will be no boring moment for them in the lab. Do you have anything to I add? don't look for skills. I mean, I will take somebody who has absolutely zero skills. Um, I pretty much talk to someone for 15 minutes, and if they I demonstrate... I don't know if she means that, to be honest, but... Well, you have very bad injection <laughs> skills, so you're on. <laughs> so, uh, no, I mean that. But, uh, you know, I, I look for someone who's enthusiastic and says, you know, I like science. I'm, I want to... I want to I want to understand what it's like to be in the lab. I want to maybe design my own experiments. Um, I think I might want to do science as a career, whatever that form is. I just look for someone who's enthusiastic. Right. I would say also I don't look for skills. I may, in a way, want them to find a certain skill set, and I want to get the feeling that they are growing within that. Like if they choose to play the violin, and I don't know the first thing about the violin, me and others can tell that after six months they have moved on from the first few weeks and then after a year they move like you you get a feeling when there's progress and that comes with a passion and so it's more the evolution of them as people using x skill rather than what that skill is okay yeah. um yeah. anita what okay. do you have? so this question is what advice would you give a student applying for a scholarship fellowship or a program i think you're the best person oh, to well. ask that question. um i i would say you know <laughs> work with your mentor. Um, but one of the things I always talk to my students about, especially the undergraduates that are going into graduate school, is that when they go they, and they select a mentor, select a men don't, don't select an institution. Don't even necessarily select a certain uh, you know, mo model system. Select a mentor that you think is going to give you the skills that you need in order to be successful. And that person, if you select correctly, I think you should go to that individual and they should be the one that help you. But recently my student um, provided me with a notebook that she put together um, about writing an F31. Mm -hmm. And so she had a binder, she had the whole SFR, r and &R, and she went through, read everything, and she basically did that in conjunction with having meetings with me and going through everything and knowing that she needed a checklist. And I think you know you can get there by going to these places, looking at what's required, asking the right questions to your mentor, asking questions to people that have done it, and I think that that's the way you should do it. And I also like one thing that you do with your students. You always have them apply to something and get letters of reference, mm -hmm. because sometimes letters of reference don't always come through, and it's better to know that, I think, than not. And so I really think I never thought of that personally. That's that was something point. you that's thought of and something that he always told his students. And I notice now that that's an important factor. Right, right. So I think the, the one thing that is very difficult to teach students is I had one of my students wanting to apply for a program. And I knew that one of your students had won it a year or two before, or maybe three years before. And I told my student, go speak to her student. And they just wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's almost like they think that, well, no, that they think I'm in going into their territory, I'm competing with them. No, that is just something that is impossible to wash away from students. Your student would have been very happy to have been asked that. Right, yeah. she would have been excited. Yeah. She, she would have been, been excited, excited and she would have vested an interest. Even if she didn't work out, she would have followed it through 
And it's this inability to go and seek out help. She may have left her with the binder. Yes, but rather I, than I, me, there know, is this but. resistance sometimes, and and it's it, being able to overcome that and reach out and asking for help. Um, some of the best ways of getting a grant is going to ask someone who had a successful grant if they will share either the grant or tips, or or at the very least if they're going to look at your grant. And mm -hmm. it takes a certain kind of humility to go and and that, and that's the hardest thing I find to teach them to do: to go and get help from someone who has already done. But it. I think they have to have an understanding that whilst we have training and we get expertise, that we still have to have that humility. We yep. can't walk around yeah. here with big yeah, egos yeah. because you can't think that you're going to do it alone. Yeah. And something I've come to learn is that none, none of us do it alone. Actually, somebody yeah. reads yeah. our grants, yeah. somebody yeah. reads yeah. our papers, yeah. somebody talks to us about whatever Venn diagrams, you know. Yeah. So I I think that that's an important thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that, that the one thing that I would say is, number one, um, it's going to take more time than you are expecting. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the one thing that, that always strikes me when I'm working on a grant, that I always think, oh, I have so much time to get ready for this. It seems like I have three months, four months to work on this. And the truth is, you need to have 95% of the grant ready like at least a month ahead of the mm -hmm. deadline. If you want to be successful, you really have to have it done almost in, in its entirety, at least a very good draft mm -hmm. of the grant, at least a month ahead of the, of the, so the how, final. So how, how early do you start? Like, uh, you know, you have a deadline February 5th. When do you start? So, like, so the, ones, start? the ones that I have been successful in, which by the way, that's the other thing that, that they need to be aware that success rates in every mm -hmm. process is low. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if they fail, it's not something that is going to say directly that they are a failure. It only means that in order to finally qualify for the Boston Marathon, you need to try a few times before yeah. you finally make it in, in the appropriate time to well, qualify. Well, science is about persistence. So, so exactly, you need yeah. to persist. So, um, so you need a lot of time. And again, when it comes down to my, my personal situation, when I fail in one period, like I send a grant, typically that first application, that first submission to that particular program was done kind of in a rush. That's, that's a constant that I find every time that I fail in a grant application. I started kind of late. I didn't think of all the things that were going to get in the way, and I ended up rushing it. But then for the next round, I typically have now a very good draft because I failed the first time, and then I built on that one. And I use the comments, I, I use the criticisms that are provided, and then I build upon, and now I keep on working as if I was still working on the grant. Mm -hmm. And then by the time that the second round comes around, I have something that has a real chance of success. Okay, so I, uh, the Francia Lab will give a free chocolate to who can guess which bit was edited out as a prize. First, first, <laughs> first winner, of course, gets the chocolate, the first one to pick up. That one is easy. Everybody no. knows that. <laughs> Come on. You so know. Is that my, even uh, a question? Come my on. last question <laughs> will like... be, uh, it's similar to what we've tackled, so I mean, I'll he's... answer it to give you time okay. to think uh -huh. about it. Okay. But it's similar to one we've tackled before. And how would you approach a student having issues with performing an experiment? So. I'll answer that and give you a few seconds to think about it. So I think I do multiple things. I, um, I first of all try and suggest uh, better positive and negative controls. Uh, I may approach the student and I very gently, maybe a few days later, offer them an alternative experimental approach to address that question while we give ourselves a breather on what they're having issues with. Um, and the third one that comes to mind, because there's many, of course, ways around this, is I, again, very gently try and suggest whether they would feel comfortable going to another lab or going to a student in another lab that has maybe done something similar and, again, ask for advice. So it's not that those three approaches have solved every stumbling block, but more often than not, they will move us to the next stage. So that's how you know, when someone is stuck on a particular experiment, maybe that experiment can be done, of course. Uh, those are the first things I try. Who wants to add to that or challenge well, that? Sometimes, sometimes the issues are technical. And technical issues very often come hand to hand with a lack of full understanding mm -hmm. of the reason behind every step that is involved in the protocol. 
So when I face that kind of situation, if it is a protocol that I am very familiar with, I actually like to have the, the, the interaction with the student, mm -hmm. asking them to describe to me step by step what they did. And if the description that they tell me sounds correct, then the next level is I need to see them do it, doing it by themselves. Because sometimes the description that they give does not reflect what they are actually truly mm -hmm. doing. And from that point of view, I, I always think of the way that you do experiments in the lab. Are you writing what you're going to do first? So you're doing the thinking ahead of the doing so that when you're in the lab, you're just executing, not necessarily just thinking of all the variables that you should have thought of before getting to the bench. So I like students to write down the experiments on their notebook with every step. And then when they are executing it, they need to be focused on the execution. They need to make sure that they are measuring the volumes, right? So they need to still be thinking, but the thinking now is, is more on the mechanical actions that are required to do the experiment, rather than on the variables that they should have considered while planning the experiment. So it's two different levels, mm -hmm. the planning and the execution. Anika? I forgot the question. So basically, you have a student, uh, they're having issues with an experiment. Yeah, you, yeah, ask okay. them, gotcha. you ask them to do a staining. And Man, it's, it's not that's happening. one way to say that. Yeah. My answer was too long. OK, thank you, Anita. <laughs> I it intensely. happens in class no, no, too. No, I was it happens intensely. in class too. It's like they ask me a question and I start answering and then the students are like. Okay. <laughs> so oh, I, guess, I guess, I guess. <laughs> so I, I feel like I'm not a good mentor in this area. Um, so hmm. because I don't do everything that you just described and I may not have done everything hmm. you described either, um, I probably spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with the student so but not in my office I probably stop at their desk mm. you know informally and I do that regularly so I'm on a daily basis weekly basis pretty in tune with the fact that they haven't got the same experiment to work over the course of five days I guess but each day I'll put, kind of sit there and mm. I'll listen to what they did and I'll recommend something so I'll say well did you do x or did you do mm. y or maybe consider something else. I don't think I've ever recommended that they go ask another student, and maybe that would be a good mm. idea. I mean, I, do, I, I don't think I've ever done that. Um, if it prolongs, I will probably do something, you know, using the reagents that they're using independently mm -hmm. of them mm -hmm. and sort of test out the reagents myself. That's where I may be a bad mentor in this, uh, this, this sort of I don't see helping why that them, is bad. Helping I mean, them, that's... instead of helping them troubleshoot, sort of, I go through the process of sort of mm. me troubleshooting, and then I'll be more in tune to, you know, why something's not working. It could be as simple as the Western blot apparatus not working properly, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that that's been the majority of how I've addressed those situations, you know, like talking informally in the lab. When it comes to many students not being able to do the same thing, probably me working with an undergrad on techniques that are important to the lab. When we find the problem, then maybe going over it in a lab meeting. We probably do that for the whole hour, you know, something like that, to then where everyone gets on the same page and uses the same approach. So I don't know if I'm technically like the greatest mentor in that area. So one thing I find really disappointing is that if someone comes to me with technical issues, I will go, well, maybe it's your trace. I have some trace here give me your cup and I'll pour some of my tris in there. It worked for me the other day. And there's nothing I find more infuriating than the student who goes, oh, try my tris. The reason is now you take that tris into your lab and there's something systemically wrong in your lab. You don't even know about it. And now we've also contaminated the one tris that I knew was safe until mm -hmm. a day ago. So when I pour an aliquot out for you, I'm protecting you, I'm protecting me, and I'm protecting us, because tomorrow we can go back to that one. And I see too many times my students go, oh, take, take, take the whole of that. And, and there goes all the positive control we had. And they don't, because they think it's rude to give out an aliquot. It's not. It's actually very caring. And that's I, yeah, impossible I, to teach. I used to be very... Um, I guess controlling over specific reagents, like even primers, right? Like I used to aliquot them out mm. 
and then only provide them in aliquoted yeah. versions because I didn't want one person in the group to contaminate it for the rest. And we still do that for things that mm -hmm. are, you know, regular, uh, like even TAC, all those kinds of things we do that. So I understand exactly mm -hmm. what you mean. But I would say that one thing is I feel like globally PIs should make an effort to be in the lab here or there yeah. to recognize because if you're not in there yeah. just from yeah. experience, oh, if yeah. I take a six month hiatus and then I go back in, I find all sorts of things that are not in a, in a working manner for them to actually mm. be trained, you know, and they don't even recognize it because they can't see those things like, like I can see them. So I think that for every good research laboratory, the PI should be in the mm -hmm. lab every now and again. If you're not, there is no way that you can help a student yeah. troubleshoot. That yeah. is my opinion. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. And I know there's plenty of people that never walk into the lab, yeah. but I think that I need to do that. I think I need to be in the aquarium. I think I yeah. need to be taking care of fish lines. I think I need to genotype once in a while. I need to clean tanks once in a while. You know, I just feel like those are the things that I need to do to just keep things moving. But for sure, if I came to your yeah. lab and I said, can I have some primers and you were to give me an aliquot, I would not think any less of you than if you had yeah. given the original. I mean, to me, that's just saying you're following good protocol. Exactly. Yeah. Which yeah. probably means yeah. your stock of primates is good to begin with. So that, that's one of the toughest things to teach, because I honestly think that students feel if I give them an aliquot, it's implying that I don't trust them. No, the, 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 in my if view, that's you've the misread case. it. If you've that's totally the case it. and students really think that, every single one of my students that's ever went through the lab would think that, they, that I don't trust them. Yeah. But it is, I, I, I aliquot everything from antibodies to restriction enzymes to primers. And you're protecting everyone by doing yeah, so. essentially. You know, because yeah. it's easy to get contamination yeah. after 4,000 reactions, that's right? Practice, and yeah. I get on people's case, right? Like, if I go in there and I use an enzyme, I can tell. I'm like, you've been freeze-thawing this, this yeah. thing a million times, and so now this isn't working the way that it's supposed to work. So I will then go to the person and say, who used it last? You aliquot it. Yeah, those, those are the kind of things that, that they are not aware until they, they finally face that something is not working simply because of something as simple as freeze-thawing the same solution exactly. too many times. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, that happens all the time with, with the NTPs and PCR reactions. If you are using the same aliquot and you're freeze-thawing it, yeah, you, hydrolysis for nucleotides is yeah. something that happens yeah. very... Ligations, for yeah. example. You can have ATP in the buffer and then freeze-thaw. Yeah, they, stop, problem, they right? stop so working simply because of hydrolysis of the, of the, the entities. And if I don't there. go into so. my lab, I'm telling you, like they, that no matter what group of students is in there at any given time, they don't really prefer to aliquot. They don't always see the benefit of it. And so, you know, if I don't go in there and sort of make sure that these standards that I've put into place are repeatedly done, then, then we will fall apart a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna ask a question to close this. Mm -hmm. You guys feel that we are motivating people to pursue PhDs, or we are we are we are pushing the people who are already doing PhDs away from our labs? I I don't know that I think it's our job to motivate them. I I so I think I've told you once before that I always was really affected by Paul Simon going to South Africa, and as I understood it, he got there with a with a group of songs, and the key he wanted them to play the songs in. They didn't know how to play in that key, so he just adapted what he had to the key they knew how to play in. So I always tell my students, don't come into the lab to make me happy. If, if, if that's what you're coming in to do, I don't think it's going to work. So I think my job is to figure out, is there something that you want to do and can I help you get there and does it fit within my program? And they wouldn't usually have come to me if I hadn't. But I don't know that it's my role to inject them with motivation. That feels to me like being a mother-in-law that's making so-and-so fall in love with that girl. You know, like, like you want to go there? Yeah, I want to go somewhere there. and You can do that in my lab. We have a deal. Let's go. But I don't know how to in inject. I don't Motivation. think we can. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think we Pretty can. Good. I mean, yeah. we can kill it, but now, yeah. Uh, well, are we killing it? Is that I, the I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't think we are killing it, but but at least I think that we are providing answers to some of the usual questions that many students may have, and maybe even some professors. I don't know. I, I've told some of my students sometimes I'm not 
we're not going to consider that because right now that's too risky for you. And it's something like going into a new field with a new technique with no controls and no expertise. And I will be honest with the student and I'll say, you know, this could take you two years and it may not work. And if it doesn't work, I won't even be sure that I know why. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm, I think we're going to dodge that for now. Uh, and I'm honest mm -hmm. with them about my risk assessment. And I'll, and I'll say I may be making the wrong decision. I mean, I did tell a student, and this is changing the topic a little bit. I have always kept away from that researcher. I have never allowed that researcher to come close to my lab. And I said to the student, um, you know what, maybe I was wrong, let's take a risk. Do you feel like taking a risk? The student said, yes, we took the risk, it failed. I'm probably now more risk averse and will be so for another year until I wear off. So, you know, things working and failing will, will impact you. Just like the stock market going up and down will impact the enthusiasm investors have for, say, new startups. Mm -hmm. um, I'm never on a constant. It's fluctuating. I'm, I'm seriously uh, uh, impacted by what's going on around me. And I've made very painful mistakes. And I don't know if the students understand that if we ask them to do something and they do it honestly for two years and it bombs, it hurts us. We sent them into that minefield. And I have very little patience for scientists who sacrifice PhD students in minefields because they want to clear the minefield. I, I simply have, I'm allergic to those people. I walk out of a room. I can't stand Well, that. I was once told, you know, early on in my training, um, you know, it's okay for a student to have a risky, uh, risky project, but every single PhD student should have something that's almost yeah. like a guarantee to yeah. work. Yeah. Yeah. And so I've really operated on that kind yeah. of idea. You know, I give opportunities elsewhere, but I, I'm a lot like you. I, I won't go somewhere and I mm. won't invest an entire, a student's whole confidence because I think you destroy someone's confidence if they yeah. go for two years and they get absolutely nothing, nothing to work. Yes. And mm -hmm. I cannot imagine yeah. that I would even want to do that all the time, yeah. right? Yeah. So there needs to be something to keep them going. Yes, yeah, so I'm not sacrificing them to, to know the answer of any. I, the most I've done is I've told someone, I'm sending you on a minefield, but three months later I'm pulling you back out. Uh, because that's, that's how much time you have. It's not healthy for you to be in there. And usually it was a very good thing we pulled them out. And our conclusion most of the times is that technique doesn't work or it doesn't work in the way it was described. And we're not investing more than three months. Like maybe if we had gone a fourth month, but we, we, we took those extreme risks, we take care with big, big gloves because I don't want to hurt the student. I would say back to your other question though, mm -hmm. I don't think that we're destroying anything um, from coming, anyone from coming to our lab. But I do think that people that listen to this, they will get a frank conversation about the divide between what a PI is thinking and what a yeah. student is thinking. Because I yeah. have noticed yeah. that we have a very different perspective because we built this program from scratch and we're yeah. entirely 100% invested in it. The students are entirely 100 invested in graduation. That's, you know, that's what they're invested in. And so, I think sometimes there's a difference in perspective and they can't understand why someone says no. So I think what you said makes a lot of sense. Mm. I'm not investing you into these two years. A student may get that and say, oh, well, he doesn't believe in me or he doesn't want me to do this or he mm. tells me no. Yeah. But I think that they don't understand the perspective that caring means sometimes you have to say no. Yeah. 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 And that's just a lonely, a lonely position we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I, you'll know which bit was edited out, but hopefully I'll have my own copy of it. That's all I wanted. In was was there anything edited? Out? No, no, absolutely. We, we <laughs> absolutely no. I mean, perfectly fine. Yeah. Did, we, uh, did we cover all we had wanted to? I think we went on a little bit longer. Yeah, we went a little bit long. Maybe two parts you'll do. It. Or maybe part one. Maybe three they, parts. If there is enough votes, they get part two. But anyway, thank you guys. Bye. All right.